Hey everyone, my name is James and welcome back to Chippy Gaming. So today I have 30 tips and tricks to help you have a better time in Terraria. Over the years, I've made a bunch of these videos, but with recent updates, a lot of them are now kind of outdated. And so today I've put together all of the ones that still work and a ton more that you probably haven't heard before. Before we get into it, if you learn anything new in this video, consider supporting it and giving it a thumbs up. And also while you're at it, why not subscribe? I'm always learning new things in Terraria and I'm gonna keep making these and by subscribing it means you won't miss the next one. All right let's get into it. First off let's talk about Shimmer. Shimmer does a lot of cool stuff and one of those things is decrafting items and well this can actually get you a free reforge without needing to pay the goblin tinkerer. Simply throw the item in, let it get decrafted, and recraft it, and every time you have a chance at a random reforge. I learned this next one from Shawnee, but I haven't had the chance to actually try it, so let's see if I can pull it off. The idea behind this one is that you can use puddles on the ground to try and find floating islands. I believe if you find a puddle that's between one and five blocks, and it isn't near a large pool of water or near the jungle, it could mean that there's a floating island above and it generated that while loading the world. So here we found a very small puddle. Let's see if there's a, a large lake nearby. Uh, okay, doesn't seem to be. So let's see if this theory is right. Let's go above. Oh my gosh, wow. Okay, this changes a lot of things for me. I've moved over to a brand new world just to try this again. I found a couple of small pools of water, so I don't see any big water nearby, and I'm going to give this a go. Is there a floating island up here? There actually is. I, I, I can't believe I never knew this. That's such a cool little tip. This next one is one I always use to make the Stardust Pillar a little bit more manageable. So the idea behind this one is that out of all of the enemies that pop up during the Stardust Pillar, the Star Cells are definitely the most easy to kill. So the concept is you take a Star Cell and you move it away from the Pillar itself. And then once you've hit it, it will split up into multiple Star Cells. And eventually what's going to happen is they're going to regrow you're going to break them again, they'll split up once again, and eventually, if you keep moving off to the right or to the left, you'll only have star cells to fight. If you're able to pull this off, this is a scenario you'll find yourself in where you're kiting around a bunch of star cells, and if you don't kill them too quickly, you can keep doing this until the pillar hits zero. If you're ever in the mood to grow some trees, a great life hack is to make sure that you're always using the smart cursor. Acorns don't actually grow if they're too close to other acorns, and the smart cursor will automatically space them out for you. Whereas if I don't use it, I can place two next to each other, but neither one of these is going to grow. If I turn on smart cursor though, it automatically places it three blocks away, which is the ideal conditions. I recently brought this up in my video, How Speedrunners Broke Terraria, but I have to talk about it again because it's so cool. If you're on a small world and you're incredibly lucky, by clicking underground using the NPC housing tool, you might be able to find yourself a pyramid. And this is because the NPC housing tool will actually pick up the entrance to the pyramid by recognizing it as a room, and it lets you know that, hey, something's down there. I use this one a lot now, but like I say, you do have to be pretty lucky. If you're ever in a pinch and you need to regen some life, there are plenty of methods like taking a healing pot, standing still, standing near a campfire, but one method that's often overlooked is simply sitting in a chair. Standing still increases life regeneration, but also sitting in a chair does as well. And this works for chairs, it works for the chippy's couch, and it also works for a bed. So I recommend always carrying a chair around with you. And if you get in a bad situation, go hide in a hole, go sit in a chair. Now here's a life hack I wish I knew sooner. If you need to do some fishing in lava for items like the bottomless lava bucket or the demon conch, you don't actually need to be in hell. I don't know why I figured this, but yeah, if you have a pool of lava anywhere in the world, that counts, and you can get those items. If you're having a particularly hard time with Golem because maybe you spawned with a really cramped temple room, one trick worth knowing is that you can actually teleport out of the room during the fight, and this means that if you need a larger room to suit your playstyle, well, you can build it down below, teleport out during the fight, and you've got a better chance. So it works just like this. You teleport out, and because of a change made in 1.4, 
Golem will follow you through block. Now, this is one I learned from Habu during GDQ, and it makes the Vortex Pillar super easy. So it turns out that enemies during the Vortex Pillar can't actually pass through blocks. So kind of like you would do for an Ice Golem, if you can stay inside of a box, well, they can't actually harm you, and you can just keep doing damage to them. And really, it's just as simple as that. It's a little hard to set up if there are tons of enemies about, but hiding in a box... I mean, we can all do that. Another one from Habu, and if you struggle with the solar pillar, I think you'll like this one a lot. So for this one, we're going to head slightly above the solar pillar, up in the sky, away from any blocks, because we're about to build a mob farm. The mob farm itself is really simple. It's just in the shape of a J. You know, I'm not using any exact measurements. And the idea is that enemies are going to spawn down in this basket once they're a certain distance away from us. Because of the blocks, we're getting protection from the enemies that do spawn. And so long as we don't jump too high away from that basket, we're not going to be hounded by crawlerpedes. So if you've got summoning weapons, this is a dream. Now this one is super simple, but I'm always surprised when I play with new people how many people don't actually pick up on this. If you're looking to know where your dungeon is in the world, well, it's super simple. It's always on the same side as the ice biome. And if you want to know where the jungle is, the jungle is always directly opposite the ice biome. King Slime may be the first boss that you take down, but you don't want to forget about him once you're in hard mode. And that's because he's perfect at farming. As you can see, throughout the fight, he spawns a bunch of different slimes that are super easy to take down. And every time you kill one of those, well, that's a chance at a biome key. If you're looking to do the pirate invasion and need a pirate map, well, bring a King Slime to the ocean and chances are you'll find one in no time. And this method doubles up if it's Christmas or Halloween because each one of these enemies once again can drop presents or goodie bags. Now this only works in expert and master mode but you can also use king slimes to farm ectoplasm as well and I believe it's something to do with the fact that in both of those modes the enemies have more health but this is really handy if you're having a tough time in the dungeon you still need a little bit more ectoplasm but you don't want to face off against 50 harder enemies. Now, here's a life hack that completely blew my mind because after all of these years of playing Terraria, I never picked up on this. During the Lunatic Cultist fight, when it goes into its duplication phase, the real version will always be above or to the right of the player. So here it is in action. And as you can see, this one is the real one off to the right, not on the left. Like, that's great. It actually blows my mind. One trick I've been using recently is taking full advantage of the class loadout system. It was added in 1.4.4, and if you use it right, it could be so handy. So what I like to do is have one loadout be my regular character, my regular build, but then use a second one and have it as a fishing loadout. So if I pull up to an ocean and I need to do some fishing quests, I have everything I already need and I don't need to fumble through my inventory, and then click F1 on your keyboard or F2 and you're swapping between the two. It's so good. And then taking it further, you could use loadout free for a building and mining build. So whenever you rock up to a project, you've got everything you need. And then if you need to switch back, you've got your regular build as well. So you may have come across crumbling brick in the dungeon. And in my opinion, in some scenarios, it's kind of hard to see. Well, something you might not know is that by using a danger sense potion, it highlights those blocks in particular and it makes traversing the dungeon a lot easier. If you decide you're brave enough to tackle legendary mode, one tip I will give you is making sure you have a good arena for Skeletron Prime. Skeletron Prime's bombs are actual bombs in legendary mode, and if you have a nice arena with a brick that won't explode, you'll save your world a lot of damage. And trust me, it doesn't take long at all for this boss to cause mayhem. If you're wanting a bunch of pylons in your world, but you don't have the right number of NPCs because you've been neglecting to get them, we've all been there, a great trick to know is that town pets and town slimes actually count as valid NPCs towards pylons. You need two NPCs to make a pylon work, so it could be any two NPCs, even these ones. And the good thing about town slimes is there are so many of them, so they're not hard to come by. And also, you can buy a bunny, a dog, and a cat. Now, here's a life hack I feel quite strongly about. If you're an older player returning to the game, you probably don't know that they've added this new feature. And for me, I think it's so good that maybe it should just be enabled by default. What you want to do is go into settings and enable auto fire. And this will make every single item in the game auto swing. And genuinely, once you've tried it, it's really hard going back to not having it. If you're wanting to grab some truffle worms to fight Duke Fishron, you might be having a hard time because they burrow away so quickly. 
A great life hack is to simply use invisibility potions. With one of these active, you can actually get really close to a truffle worm and it doesn't flee. OG players might not know this, but they changed this potion in 1.4 as well so that it now reduces enemy spawn rates by 20%, which is more than a calming potion. And this is amazing because in my opinion, they're even easier to obtain than a calming potion. On the topic of Jukefish Rom, for a casual player, it's a pretty tough fight, especially with its fast movement speed. And that's why I always recommend crafting some asphalt block. All you need to do is place it down above your ocean and it means that whenever you hit the ground to reset your flight you have increased movement speed which makes the fight easier. Now let's talk about duplicating liquids because if you need a fishing pool in any part of the world and you don't already have a bottomless bucket or access to pump shed it can be really annoying but duplicating water is very simple. All you need to do is make a simple structure like this and hold down the water bucket right here. And it's that simple, it will duplicate water. When it comes to duplicating lava, it's a very similar process, but it's a lot slower and a little bit more finicky. What you need to do is place down the lava like so, wait for it to droop off the end, pick it back up, and then rinse and repeat. It's, it's not the best thing, but if you do need lava in a pinch, it works. Here's a fun life hack from Red himself. He tweeted out, I usually carry a stack of doors and place them in my tunnels to keep monsters out. This works wonders in the underground desert. He also tweeted, pro tip, dig a one tile hole to trap worms, collect at your leisure. Something which I now actively do. I like this tip. This next trick is one the game doesn't teach you. You have to read it on Wikipedia, but it's actually so handy. If you want to play as a mage and you really want to get your hands on Tim's wizard hat, well, wearing a gem robe actually makes it way easier to find him. So you don't need to be wearing any gem robe in particular. They all work and it takes his spawn rate from 1 in 200 to 1 in 50, which honestly saves so much time when you're farming. This next tip actually makes me nostalgic because I used to use it all the time when I was bad at Skeletron. It's a really good idea to move your Dryad into your Skeletron arena because every time the Dryad feels threatened, she'll do Dryad's Blessing and it will actually give you 8 extra defense. And when you're at that point in the game, 8 extra defense, it can go a long way. I actually feel like this is why they added the Bass statue in, which gives you 5 defense for just being around it, because so many players used to use this one. One of my favorite items in Terraria, hands down, has to be the slice of cake. And one of the things I do at the very start of every Terraria adventure is I build a bunch of homes, hoping to get as many NPCs as quickly as possible, so that I'll get the chance to get a party girl. Whenever there's a naturally spawning party in the world, if you speak to her, if you're the first person, she will give you the slice of cake. And my trick is this, carry this around with you everywhere you go. It's such an incredible buff. It only lasts for two minutes, but it gives you 20% increased movement and mining speed. And it doesn't matter at what point you are in Terraria, a 20% buff to movement and mining is huge. For this next life hack, let's talk about pylons. If you're looking for a certain pylon from a certain biome, but you don't want to remember which NPC goes where or who they go with, all you need to do is simply have an arms dealer living with a nurse, and it doesn't matter what biome that you're in, he will always sell you the pylon. So here we are in the snow biome, a biome that he actively hates, but because of the nurse, He'll sell you it. Now, if you don't want to go with the arms dealer nurse combination, another good way to get a pylon is by having an NPC live in a biome that they love and pairing them up with an NPC that they don't actively hate. So for this life hack, if you want to know which NPC loves which biome, all you need to do is simply use the bestiary. If you click on an NPC, it will tell you exactly which biome that they love and in the background, it will show you that biome as well. Now, this one isn't one I'd expect you to use all the time, but it's really handy to know. If you're ever in a pinch and you need to spawn in the wall of flesh, rather than farming for a guide voodoo doll, you can simply drop the guide into lava and that will spawn the wall of flesh. No farming needed. And that's it for today. If you have any tips and tricks yourself, please leave me a comment down below. I'm always wanting to learn new ones. Thanks for watching. Peace.